What is God? That's a question that has been around from the very start of human consciousness and will last until we no longer exist. Attack on Titan has its own application of this question, and this video will show how that culminates within Eren Yeager by the end of the story. It will be split into two parts, the first of which will be a thorough explanation of the time loop that exists within the story, and the second showing how that loop ties perfectly to the commentary of God through Eren himself. I know this might seem somewhat outlandish right now, but I ask you to listen to everything I will say before coming to your conclusion. I hope that by the end of this video you will not only agree with my point of view, but also see just how impressive the character of Eren Yeager truly is, not to mention the story that is Shingeki no Kyojin. First I'll explain exactly what the time loop theory is and how it originated. It's essentially any line of thought based on the idea that the world of AOT exists within a loop, with the end of the story flowing back to the beginning and restarting. I will be putting forth the argument that this loop does in fact exist, but only in the context of Eren himself. It is his life specifically that loops from chapter 1 where he wakes up from the long dream, to the end of his life where Mikasa kills him. So now that I've laid the framework, we have to ask ourselves if such an idea is even feasible. The theory was so popular, especially in Japan, that Isayama and his editors themselves were aware of it, with the idea being discussed by Isayama's editor Shintaro Kawakubo in an interview after the ending of the series. I think it was one of the things Isayama was worried about. From the very first chapter, there was a description that made me think of a loop, but if it really was a loop, some people would be disappointed. However, as the story of Ymir the Founder unfolds, there are things that cannot be changed. But then, how would the reader feel if it was drawn in a way that makes it feel like a loop? Ultimately, Kawakubo left the conclusion up to the reader's interpretation, saying, I can't say that it is a loop, and I can't say that it isn't a loop. It's up to the readers to decide. To me, this sounds as if Isayama did in fact intend for the loop to exist, but was worried about backlash should he make that explicitly clear. So at the very least, I think we can all agree that the idea is free to explore or to believe it. My argument is rooted in the fact that AOT's world is defined by the laws of compatibilism. The positional view that causal determinism is true, but we still act as free, morally responsible agents when, in the absence of external constraints, our actions are caused by our desires. Determinism is the philosophical view that all events are determined completely by pre-existing causes. Eren exemplifies this idea of compatibilism as his future memories make him a perfect predictor of the future. The world is inherently deterministic as what he sees happens with 100% accuracy. But as he states, this is only because they align with his desires. Chapter 130 is the best example of this where he states, Even if all of this was set in stone from the start, this describes causal determinism. Even if all of this was what I wanted, this describes him as a morally responsible agent due to his desires. Everything is still ahead. Invaders has a hugely popular video that already explains this concept fully, which I will link below in case you haven't already seen it for further elaboration. Now that we know AOT functions in a deterministic universe where the timeline is set in stone, we ask if a loop can still exist within that. The answer to that is yes, due to the causal loops that already exist within the story. A causal loop is a theoretical proposition in which, by means of either retrocausality or time travel, a sequence of events is among the causes of another event, which is in turn among the causes of the first mentioned event. There are two specific examples of this in AOT. Causal loop example 1. Dina eats Carla in front of Eren, first event, which causes a sequence of events that leads to Eren receiving the power of the founder to manipulate time, second event which he uses to influence Dina to skip over Berthold, thereby causing the first event, Carla being eaten in front of Eren's eyes. The loop repeats infinitely to the point no specific origin can be determined. This is given the name, the bootstrap paradox. Causal Loop 2 Grisha kills Frida Rees and the other royal family members bar Rod, and then gives the soul and power to Eren, first event which causes Eren to have the Founding Titan power that allows him to enter Grisha's memories with Zeke, second event, where Eren influences Grisha to kill Frida, thereby causing the first event. 
Now that we have categorical evidence of two loops already existing within the story, I can fully explain the mechanics behind the greater, different type of loop that is Eren's life in the context of the manga. In chapter 1, Eren sees the future memory of Mikasa saying, see you later, from the long dream in chapter 138. However, he doesn't have any titan powers at this point, so we already know that this isn't an organic event, but instead something that happened to child Eren. He wakes up crying but doesn't remember why. However, adult Eren was crying in paths to Armin upon thinking of his death. By this I mean that child Eren has no reason to cry as he has no recollection of the events. Therefore, it must instead be the adult version of Eren who is feeling these emotions of pain and loss that manifest itself through the tears of the child version. Babies also cry when they are born, therefore it might be symbolic of quote-unquote rebirth through the loop. There is also no other example of a non-Titan holder receiving future memories, and in the case of existing future memories such as Grisha or attaining past memories like Falco, there is no precedent for them being forgotten so quickly. This oddity raises suspicion as to whether or not the same thing is really happening in Eren's case that we've seen before with others. Therefore, what I am proposing is that Child Eren does not in fact receive a future memory, but instead it's the lasting future Eren sees as his essence is sent back to the start of the loop. The slight overlap is used to point out to the audience that this loop does in fact exist, and works in-universe with Eren only remembering the final moment, while still feeling as if there was an entire long dream, the chapter title of 138. Eren is also lying on a tree that will go on to hold himself as the source of life after his death, tying these elements together symbolically as the place he returns to. To better understand how this could work, we need to look at the nature of the source that gave the founder Ymir her powers originally. The easiest way to describe it would be through an analogy. It's essentially a wish-granting genie, but for innate desires. Everything Ymir creates, titans, paths, and the connection to all Eldians, are an extension of what she truly desired deep down, as laid out by Zeke and then Armin in chapter 137. That is why we face the punishment known as fear, and why that child so desperately sought to avoid such pain. Greater power, greater size, she gave birth to an undying body, and then she escaped to a world that was free, even of death. The greater size and undying body refers to the creation of titans and her own regenerative ability, because she was scared, hurt and on the run at the time she first got the power. The world free of death refers to paths, which is the second application of the genie, however Armin and Zeke explain the paths phenomena further. Zeke says, For 2000 years she remained here, obeying him. For what reason? Yes she did still feel attached to the world she left behind. And Armin goes on to say, Every Eldian is connected to one another by the paths. I think it's because the founder Ymir wanted to be connected. This need for connection is obvious throughout her story. She's so desperate due to her trauma and abuse that she connects to that same abuser King Fritz after she inherits the Titans and is suddenly of value to him. By suddenly of value, I mean that she went from being just another slave who was tortured and eventually chased like livestock, to someone with a higher status, a house, and trust to do important tasks. This is evident in the guidebook, which states that she at first viewed her children as an extension of her bond to Fritz, as a gift, and it is only after she grows past her horrific trauma with the help of Mikasa that she realises she wanted to save her children instead of jumping in front of the spear. However, as a victim of abuse, this connection to Fritz obviously puts her in extreme mental agony and she loses the will to regenerate, thereby creating paths instead and extending that need for connection to all Eldians. To recap, the second quote unquote wish for Ymir is the creation of paths due to her need for connection and fear of death, but also the agony that stopped her from regenerating in the real world. Now we can look at how this translates to Eren himself. Firstly, we need proof that Eren does in fact share the same power. We see this in chapter 122, whereby after connecting to Ymir, we see the hallucinogenia come out of his spine and attach to his head. Therefore, he has the source and we are free to discuss his wishes. 
The first wish is evident as it's fully laid out in chapter 131, the rumbling. When I learned that humanity had survived beyond the walls, I was so disappointed. I wished for it. I wanted to wipe it all away. I'm sorry. There are of course other reasons as to why he carried out the rumbling, such as his love for his friends, wanting to give Paradis a fighting chance and wanting to end the Titan curse, but it's this honest and primal innate drive for freedom that separates Eren from the other characters in the story, acting as the wish that is translated through the power of the founder. This is why the skeletal figure of his final titan form is so important, with its huge cage of bones and it being held up like a puppet on strings. It's the representation that despite everything, he still feels trapped and is desperately seeking his idea of freedom, his guilt and inner conflict also stopping the regeneration of his main body, just like Ymir's agony stopped hers. It's very important to note that it is this extreme guilt and knowledge he can never be forgiven that stops the regeneration, not a sudden change in his outlook or value towards life itself. I don't want to die. I want to be with Mikasa, with everyone. No, I'm sure none of them wanted to die either, but how could I ever be forgiven? This describes how Eren knows he can no longer live due to his actions, but there's still being some part of him that wants to, and this is the catalyst for the second wish, the loop. His most intrinsic desire is to be free because he was born into this world, and it is this very desire to live that activates the power of the founder and sends him back to live again. It's the culmination of his dynamic with Ymir. Ymir hated her existence, which caused her so much agony, therefore upon her death, she created a parallel world due to her desires. However, Eren values life incredibly highly as he links being born to the right of being free. Therefore he does the opposite and simply restarts that life upon his own death. These are the ultimate expressions of their innermost feelings through the power of God. Ymir's need for connection traps her in paths, whereas Eren's drive for freedom ironically leads to him being trapped in an eternal loop. In chapter 130, this is even hinted at, when Eren says, I wonder where it all started. The first thing he thinks about, before Ymir freeing the pigs, the act that set the story in motion, or even his own birth, is the memory of him and Mikasa at the tree in chapter 1, which would be the start of the loop. The start of the manga itself, for Eren. Everyone is a slave to something. And Eren in his very existence becomes the ultimate culmination of this theme. A very interesting aspect of this argument exists in meta-commentary. Meta is when a creative work is self-referential, i.e. it refers to itself, or as it's most commonly known, it is breaking the fourth wall. In AOT this would be any acknowledgement that it is indeed a manga or anime. An example of Isayama using this would be in chapter 87 and the anime adaptation, where Sergeant Gross looks directly at the audience while talking about how people enjoy watching brutality. This acknowledges that AOT itself has many fans due to the brutal nature of its world. So how does this apply to Eren or The Loop? Eren is the protagonist of Attack on Titan, a manga that uses a deterministic universe. The boundless freedom he sought was inherently an impossibility due to the confines of his own creation. By looking at it this way, we can see that his loop literally restarts every single time someone picks up the manga or watches the anime. So his loop in the manga is created by his innate desires and that translates to the real world where his life loops for every different reader. To further strengthen this, we can look at the long dream in chapter 138. AOT is deterministic, therefore it's impossible for it to truly happen in-universe, but it's also the scenario where Eren abandons his role as the protagonist, which can't occur in a meta-sense as that is the role he was created for. It is also the culmination of the nature versus nurture theme that Isayama has spoken about regarding Furuya's Himionole, a manga he was inspired by, in a 2017 interview. I knew society would consider the serial killer in the story unforgivable under social norms, but when I took into account his life and background, I still wondered, if this was his nature, then who is to blame? I even thought, 
Is it merely a coincidence that I wasn't born a murderer? We cannot deny that under such circumstances, the victim's feelings are very important, but considering the root of the issue, rather than evaluating what is right, to be influenced by various other works and their philosophies, and to truthfully illustrate my exact feelings during those moments, I think that's what the ending of Shingeki no Kyojin will resemble. It's obvious Isayama wanted to draw the nature part of Nature vs Nurture through Eren, and that is shown through his decision to rumble, but it's also emphasised in The Long Dream and The Loop. Mikasa would be the nurture component in Eren's life, someone he loved, wanted to protect, and who represented the beauty in his cruel world. This is also made explicitly clear through the ED7 of Attack on Titan anime, Akuma no Ko, which parallels the first ED that focuses on Mikasa, answering her question of what he wants to protect, saying, This world is cruel, but I still love you. There's no doubt about the importance Mikasa, Nurture, holds to Eren, but the long dream being an impossibility shows how his nature will override that, just like Isayama said. The loop means this will always occur. He is truly a slave to his own nature, and despite returning to the past with the memories of the time he chose Nurture, i.e. the long dream, nothing changes. This also ties to the idea of Sekaiki, explained by Kawakubo. This is the idea that stories are formed around the relationship between two characters and how that relationship affects and impacts the other characters and world around them, with Kawakubo saying, The word Sekaiki was also in Isayama's mind. It, AOT, is the story of Eren and Mikasa. I believe the statement only truly works in the context of the loop where their dynamic and the long dream genuinely plays a big role on the scope of the story itself and the commentary of nature versus nurture. Along with everything I've discussed thus far, there's one detail in particular that offers a very strong case. Page 13 of chapter 1, the page that has See You Later Eren and him waking up, is the only numbered page in the entire manga. The contents of the long dream in chapter 138 so every page that happens after she enters the long dream added to the pages of Eren's death equal a total of 12 pages. Hence the 12 pages of the long dream and Eren's death flow back to the loop, page number 13. This could just be a coincidence, but Isayama has done this on two other occasions, making it very unlikely. Ymir lives for 13 pages after she encounters a hallucinogenia to the moment she enters paths upon her death. Zeke in chapter 115 also lives for 13 pages after receiving the power in his flashback up until he enters Parves. I struggle to think that this is all a big coincidence, especially considering Isayama's obsession with numerology, which is evident with his chapter numbers. For example, the number 131 is symbolic of a personal sense of freedom, taken from affinity numerology. 131 represents an independent energy, like a colourful bird. In fact, a colourful bird among flowering trees, self-reliant and expressing its personal freedom by flying where it will, is a wonderful example of 131 energy. Sound familiar? Chapters 137 and 139 are the same, with 137 saying, The energy represented by the number 137 enjoys company and relates well with others of its own kind. Others of its own kind being energy that is also inclined to prefer cooperation and coexistence, yet also recognises the need to do things alone from time to time. This energy resonates with teamwork and diplomacy. This is a pretty clear link to Armin and Zeke, who both suffered from extreme self-loathing and ended up cooperating, the teamwork of them and the past shifters being the turning point. As for 139, the number 139 represents and symbolises the end of a cycle. Not a real death, but just the end of one period and the beginning of another. 139 thus evokes much more a transition than the pure and simple disappearance of something. There is therefore a real fusion between the past and future, with the present serving as a gestation period. This is a nod to how the cycle of titans ends, but a different cycle may begin due to Eren's existence as the tree. But the false death and merging of the past and future also apply to Eren existing in a loop. He never truly dies in the context of his own life, but the world carries on after him. There's also Isayama's deep influence from North mythology which can be linked. Some obvious examples would be the world tree, Yggdrasil, as the paths tree, Needhog, who gnaws at the roots of the world tree as the hallucinogenia which exists in the fluid beneath AOT's tree, 
and of course the rumbling which represents Ragnarok. John Lindo in his Handbook of Norse Mythology points out that there seems to be a cyclic arrangement to these old texts, with the Ragnarok poem in Velos before specifically implying there was a cyclical notion at work. Isayama also wouldn't be the first in modern pop culture to apply a cyclical element to Norse mythology, with Marvel's take on Loki, grappling with determinism through time travel and God of War flat out having Ragnarok exist within a time loop. The final, and perhaps the biggest piece of evidence, is that, on Attack on Titan's official website, Shingeki.net, the See You Later scene in chapter 138 has been placed as the very first event in the story. This heavily strengthens the idea that the scene acts as a loop which flows back to the beginning, to the point of essentially confirming it. With the existence of all of this evidence, I believe the conclusion that Eren exists within the loop is not only fair, but likely. I also posit that Eren, once he has achieved the full power of rumbling, is aware of this loop due to him thinking about the start of the loop when questioning where it all started. This gives his final expression when facing his death to Mikasa infinite layers. How many times has this happened? How many times must he be resigned to this fate? Does he view this as the punishment he must bear for his sins? I believe that's something that should be left open to the audience, to us. To recap, Eren starts the loop by his essence returning to his former self through the power of the Founder. Eren is eternally forced to repeat this loop as he cannot override his nature, literally through people reading the manga. Now we'll look at the commentary of Eren as God, and how that perfectly aligns with the idea of the loop and why it makes it so well written. Firstly, it is important to note that Isayama seemingly takes a predominantly monotheistic stance on the idea of God within the context of the story at the start. Monotheism is just a doctrine or belief that there is only one God, with religions such as Judaism, Islam and Christianity adhering to this. This is shown throughout the story starting with the wall religion, who worship the walls as a gift from God, and it is later shown they in fact worship the king of the walls, who holds the founding titan power, as that very God. In fact, the pacifism of the king and the sermons described by Kenny are a direct reference to the teachings of Christianity in the New Testament, so the link to monotheism is very clear. However, it is incredibly important to understand that at no time does Isayama link the idea of God to one of objective morality or even of truth. Rod Rees explicitly outlines the concept of monotheism to Historia at the cave, saying, <laughs> So Rod outlines a classic monotheistic god, however this doesn't actually align with the story because it directly contradicts what that very god, Yuri himself admits to Kenny. He says, The very fact Yuri was not able to do something means that he is not all powerful, therefore Rod was incorrect in his statement and that brings us to the main commentary Isayama is describing. This was merely Rod's belief. The godlike power does indeed exist and that is the entire point of Kenny's grand dream, to see if that godlike power would grant even a piece of garbage like him freedom. Isayama presents the power of God and then asks, what would God look like if he was human? One of the core components of monotheism is that God is an objective being. Objectivity is the absence of any bias or prejudice, to be completely fair, and is the opposite of subjectivity, which describes being based on or influenced by personal feelings, tastes and opinions. God is right because he is God, and right is God because it is right. In Attack on Titan, we are instead presented with the power of God applied purely through human subjectivity, and this is made clear through Onyon Kapon's misconception when answering Armin's question, who made us? As we know, the thing that gave Ymir power wasn't a god or objective being, it was merely a source that reacted based off the wishes, 
traumas and personal feelings of the wielder, i.e. it gives form and power to pure human subjectivity. This is what I explained prior in the use of the power by Ymir and Eren. The second part of his statement is also vital. The idea that maybe none of this matters as we are free to choose our own truths, again moving away from the idea of any objectivity in terms of how we choose to perceive the world. A narrative example of this would be Elena, who chooses to view Zeke as her god due to him saving her. Eren Kruger's speech to Grisha regarding Ymir wraps this all up very concisely. マーレス兵権下では悪魔の使い。エルディア帝国の時代では神がもたらした奇跡。有機生物の起源と接触した少女。そうとなえるものもいる。はあ。この世に真実などない。それが現実だ。誰だって神でも悪魔にでもなれる
and the ones he killed is nothing other than cruel. The most important thing to note is that Eren is not in any one of these categories, instead he represents them all. This is best displayed through the interplay of the Freedom Panel in Chapter 131 and the corresponded Grounded Panel in Chapter 139 by highlighting a perfect duality within his psyche and character. 131 shows a genuine sense of freedom from the perspective of an ignorant child, while 139 shows the deconstruction of that idea through the eyes of an adult who knows better. The ignorance, stated by Eren himself to be the thing furthest removed from freedom, is clear in 131 itself. He's in his child form, his real adult eyes are closed, the titan smoke acts as pseudo clouds which block his sight, the titans of the rumbling enclose him, acting like the walls that symbolise his lack of freedom growing up, the sequencing and panelling emphasising this notion. Despite all of this, the child version of Eren genuinely feels a sense of freedom due to the subjectivism I laid out earlier, and this is juxtaposed completely by the adult Eren in 139. The juxtaposition is highlighted by how the panels are mirror opposites in every conceivable way. Adult versus child, flying versus on the ground, sitting versus standing, hair tied up versus hair free, eyes half shut versus wide open, with Armin and alone, looking straight ahead versus looking down, and most importantly, clarity versus smoke. He is simultaneously experiencing fleeting freedom as a child with the crushing guilt and knowledge that it isn't freedom as an adult, due to how time functions in paths and his role as the founder. The founder's power has made it so that there's no past or future, it all exists at once. These two moments both exist at the same time, in the span of his conversation to Armin, again strengthening him as a representation of all sides of existence, instead of one or the other. This is the idea of monism, which attributes oneness or singleness to a concept, e.g. existence. Eren is an application of monism because he is connected to and experiences every event that happens in the story through parts, and himself holds the duality of all of the themes of the story. He symbolically represents existence itself, especially when you view all the events as occurring in his own loop. This idea of monism is best described within the story itself, when Sarva speaks to Zeke about the founding titan and its abilities. <laughs> All Eldians are a part of the Founding Titan, therefore Eren encompasses all Eldians and their experiences within himself, i.e. monism. The story of Attack on Titan is 100% told through the lens of subjects of Ymir, as there isn't a single scene that exists from the perspective of any other race. For example, even when we follow General Magath in the Mali arc, those scenes are still occurring in the presence of Willy Tiber, an Eldian. The Mali War Council is in the presence of Zeke, and the Liberia Raid is in the presence of countless Eldians. The only scene that occurs with zero Eldian presence is when the officers are listening into the warriors' conversation prior to the Liberia Raid. And we only see this because Zeke knows it is happening and tips off Reiner. Therefore it is true that all events that occur within the story are also encompassed by Eren as all Eldian experience is united within him as a part of his symbolic body. It perfectly aligns with the Stoic theology regarding both God and monism. Stoics believe God is never fully transcendent but always imminent, a doctrine which states that the divine encompasses the material world and identified God with nature. Eren encompasses the material world as I outlined prior and we have specific examples of Eren identifying as nature, such as the bird pop of the rumbling in 131, the bird that looks at Armin in 131, and the bird pop of Falco's memory shard. This tie to nature is emphasised fully with the final chapter of the story. Even after his death, his oneness with the universe is so strong that the universe carries out his own actions. His promise to wrap the scarf around Mikasa is fulfilled by a bird, and his promise to go beyond the walls with Armin is fulfilled by the bird dropping a feather, both things he himself couldn't do but are carried out by nature. These are all extensions of monism, as is Eren literally becoming nature in the final panel via the tree. Stoicism also considers all existence as cyclical, just like the Hindu conception of existence, with the cosmos eternally self-creating and self-destroying. 
By replacing Cosmos with Eren for Attack on Titan, you can see again how well constructed this is for the loop idea. I'd also like to be clear that I'm not saying Isayama is directly using all of these sources although the probability is likely, I'm merely showing how Eren's writing aligns with commonly held philosophy or theology that makes the ideas in the story consistent. This idea of monism through the experiences of others is strengthened on three separate occasions where Eren has already experienced something without doing it himself. The first of these is at the ocean where he states it's exactly the same as his father's memory. This is important because the sea was one of the things that held so much value to Eren, and unlike the others, the memory already existing in his head robs him of the opportunity to experience it for the first time. It's again brought up in his conversation with Zeke in Mali. He isn't just remembering these events, he is experiencing them as if he had already lived it through the paths. The same is true for normal, everyday events which should bring joy. When Mikasa brings him the ice cream in chapter 123, he isn't excited or glad. He merely states he already knows about it through Grisha's memories and this is before becoming the founding titan, where the effect of this is increased exponentially. This all ties to the idea of Eren as this chained god. A huge part of Eren's drive is this idea of going beyond, of seeking new experiences and not being trapped by the environment one is born into, exemplified through the nature of the attack titan. The nature of his memories and his existence at the end of the story robs him of this central aspect of his character. To fulfill his goals and to keep moving forward, he sacrifices an integral part of himself and robs himself of his own freedom. It's also why the moment when Mikasa kills him is so beautifully tragic. For this, it's important to note that Eren has his eyes closed within the mouth of his founding form and only opens them and looks up at the very moment Mikasa cuts off his head, the moment his connection to the founder is severed. This is why his knowledge surrounding what exactly Mikasa will do is incomplete. It is his first, last, and only thing he truly experiences for himself. Tragic in it being his own death at the hands of the one he loves, but beautiful in that she allowed him to truly experience something, anything again, for the first time as God. Again, this plays into Sakaiki, which I explained earlier. Of course, it refers to how their dynamic is a thing that brings an end to the Titan curse, which is central to the story. But through the lens of the loop, we can see that Mikasa is the first and last thing Eren experiences for himself in the context of the story. I'd like to thank Demi.534 on Instagram for bringing up this idea, so I'll leave the link to his Instagram down below. Eren is existence or as someone who resides in the ambiguity between black and white concepts by encompassing them all is further strengthened through the ties between him and cycles. This exists in the Children of the Forest theme, which outlines how the cycle of hatred affects children and becomes self-fulfilling. To some, Eren will have taken children, such as Historia's child, out of the forest by removing the Titan curse, but to the mainlanders he is the very representation of that cycle as stated in chapter 134. We exploited hatred. We kept feeding our resentment. We even thought our hate would save us. We dumped every problem caused by our shortcomings onto an island of devils. And the result was the birth of that monster which has now come to return our hatred upon our own heads. To them, Eren is the very embodiment of the cycle of hatred. A cycle inherently has no start or end point. Just like his self-made loop or how he is viewed differently based on perspective, there is no true way to place him in a single category as he instead encompasses them all. This is true even for his very character. Through the manipulation of Dina, Eren creates his own causal loop that informs his actions throughout. There is no specific start or end point. Eren both creates his actions due to his nature and is created by how those actions and events traumatize him as a child. He is both shaped by and shapes existence within the context of the story, and there is no better application of this than through the use of retrocausality for both his psyche and the story itself. This is something that has been touched on by others regarding Eren's future memories and how they inform his actions and the ties to free will through Newcomb's paradox, but I'll still outline the idea and go on to show how it in fact ties to the story as a whole. 
Retrocausality or backwards causation is a concept of cause and effect in which an effect precedes its cause in time and so a later event affects an earlier one. In simpler terms, it's just when an event in the future is a contributor to something happening in the past. This is evident in terms of Eren Psyche with his future memories, an example being how he recognises Ramsay as someone he is going to save and that is partly why saving Ramsay was a concept in his mind in the first place. Again, this has already been touched on, so I'll look at it predominantly through the lens of Eren's connection to Ymir and the nature of the Attack Titan itself. This is the description of the Attack Titan as given by Eren Kruger. More than Grisha, or even Kruger himself, this description is one that perfectly fits Eren. After all, it contains one of his most iconic catchphrases, I will keep moving forward, and his most deep-seated desire, the pursuit of freedom. The Attack Titan is Eren's nature itself. This nature is carried back in time throughout every Attack Titan holder all the way back to the Progenity Emir, just like how Karl Fritz's vow of pacifism affected those after him. To view this as a possibility, we need some narrative evidence that this effect can work backwards, so first let's look at that. First off is the description of how paths work that Eren and Kruger explain. <laughs> All Titans, all subjects of Ymir are connected to that coordinate through paths that transcend physical space. Through these words we see categorically that the will to act can be passed along the paths, and that all subjects of Ymir, regardless of time or space, are connected to the founding titan, i.e. Eren. This is also not a one-way system from past to future, as we know by Kruger's final words to Grisha. Here we see he received memories from Eren in the future, and they were so potent he actually repeated them out loud as if they were a part of himself, categorical evidence that the future directly affects the past. This in turn also affects the future, as they are the words Grisha tells to Eren himself, and may have even played a part in Grisha wanting Eren to meet Mikasa, i.e. this is retrocausality in motion. There's even more emphasis given to the idea that it is in fact Eren's wishes and story that is the thing driving all attack titans, through Grisha's words in chapter 121. <laughs> Essentially, all Attack Titans have been led to a memory where Eren directly influences the past due to his desires, and that is why the Attack Titan has acted the way it has from the very start. It was all due to Eren's will to go against the king, literally shown by him having to actively participate in the event by convincing Grisha to do the deed. Again, we have strong emphasis on retrocausality that affects the distant past, the very first inheritor of the Attack Titan, but what if it goes even further than that? For this, we'll have to look at the same scene I mentioned in the loop, with Eren thinking about where it all started in 130. But this time we'll look at the second panel that is displayed. After the thought of him and Mikasa at the tree, i.e. the loop, he turns to the act that set the story in motion, Ymir freeing the three pigs. This act is given further emphasis in the opening page of the final volume, as we see Ymir's eyes unshaded for the only time in her entire backstory when she opens the gate. To understand the importance of eyes, we have to look at King Fritz's words in chapter 122. Slaves have no need for two eyes. This is why her eyes are shaded throughout the backstory. All the other slaves' eyes are shaded, and the king himself who is a slave to Avarice has his own eyes shaded too. 
She only has her open eyes three times in the story, when Eren first connects to her and tells her she isn't a slave, after Mikasa frees her from her trauma. She is also an adult here showing her mental growth, and when she's freeing the pigs. The eyes and the freeing of the pigs shows that this was due to a desire for freedom that the story was set in motion, as it's directly because of this act that Ymir is forced into the forest where she encounters the tree and gains the power of the founder. As this is viewed through Eren's own eyes, it is also heavily implied that it may well be due to Eren's own nature that had some part to play in this. To give evidence, we already know that Eren is connected to Ymir's mind through the explanations of her life that he gives to Armin in 139, and we already know his will is strong enough to go back to the very first attack titan, so why would the progenitor be excluded from this? On top of this, Ymir is a character who has zero agency throughout the entire story, her deep trauma debilitating her to the point she cannot act for her own sake or separate her desires from that of the king. Even when granted the power of God, she remains a slave due to her trauma, and she only starts the rumbling in the first place due to Eren's intervention, and then is freed through Mikasa's actions. Therefore, it is extremely inconsistent to assume that such a huge act like freeing the pigs came purely as a result of her own desires or agency. All these things point to it being retrocausality in motion once again, through Eren once he receives the power of the Founder, influencing the story from the very beginning. Now we get to the crux of retrocausality. How far is the story influenced by Eren, and how far is Eren in turn influenced by the story? Just like the causal loops, Eren's future memories, and Eren encompassing aspects of existence, there is no direct answer for this, and Eren remains in that place of ambiguity where it is very much based on your own perception of how you choose to view him. Again, the perfect application of subjectivism. Again, I want to note that all of this talk of retrocausality and a deterministic universe doesn't take away from the agency of our characters. Buddhism also falls under the general rubric of compatibilism and soft determinism. While they adhere to strong causality by means of the karmic cycle, they never found a problem with that idea taking away from the moral culpability of humans. Taken from Buddhism and Freedom of the Will by Nicholas Greer and Paul Yelberg. In terms of the contemporary free will debate, the Buddhists believe in free action, but have no conception of free will as a self-determining power that moral agents somehow possess. These Buddhists believe that we are morally responsible for our own character and intentions, which although completely conditioned by prior events, are nonetheless what we truly want and should do. Now everything I've spoken of gets even more interesting when looked at through the lens of Meta. From Eren encompassing existence in the context of AOT, to the loop, to Eren as a representation of subjectivism. For this we'll look at the title of the manga. Shingeki no Kyojin doesn't mean Attack on Titan, it actually means the Attack Titan. We know that the Attack Titan is the symbolic representation of who Eren truly is, it's Eren's nature itself. Therefore the manga and everything it entails is in fact Eren, which is brilliantly done since Eren is connected to every part of the story by the end, as explained through the description of monism. It also strengthens the idea of the loop happening in a meta sense by people reading the manga or watching the anime, as both are symbolically Eren himself. To be clear, I've mentioned all of these aspects that contribute to Eren as god because it's how they tie to the story that makes it so impressive. For example, Eren representing cycles is brilliant because AOT is a story that discusses the cycle of hatred in depth. The same is true for Eren representing subjectivism. AOT is a story that is insistent on showing the differing perspectives in a conflict, shown through the point of view switch in the Mali arc and through the repetition of the question, who is the enemy, as the story progresses. Eren remaining chained by his desires and subjectivity is good, because a central theme in AOT is that everyone is a slave to something. This theme is a clear representation of another Stoic philosopher's words, Seneca in his letters to Lucilius discussing slavery. He is a slave. Show me one who isn't. One person is a slave to lust, another to greed, a third to ambition, and all are slaves to hope. All are slaves to fear. Eren is again shown to fully represent the themes outlined in the story that serves as an extension of him. Finally, Eren representing existence through monism is perfect because he does all of these things simultaneously by the end, as the protagonist who inherently is a vehicle for the themes of a narrative. 
Before going on to Eren and Attack on Titan's final say, this is also why the tree is so perfect as the final panel. Not only by showing human nature to both continue the cycle of hatred and seek to find a solution from it, but also because it gives categorical evidence that the source of life does indeed reside within Eren. It also remains ambiguous as to what the child will create with their own desires to perfectly conclude the theme of subjectivism in Attack on Titan's final say. Even in a deterministic universe where all of our actions are set in stone, even if there is no inherent meaning to what we do or who we are, none of that matters if we choose to derive our own meaning through our own lives and our own experiences. This is why the story structure with 131 and 139 happening at the same time is so vital. Even though the conclusion was already set in stone, we as readers and the characters as characters found their own meaning in the chapters leading up to that. That fate was only set in stone due to the actions taken in the chapters preceding 139. These are still choices that are important to the characters despite Eren existing as a being who has seen it all already. It is our very subjectivity, our very bias that can give a seemingly meaningless life incredible value. This is highlighted at the end through Zeke, Armin, Mikasa, and Eren. Zeke finds value in playing catch in his bond with Sava that allows him to view a beautiful day for the first time. A change in perspective causes a change in his reality, i.e. subjectivism. Mikasa chooses to both value their bond and kill Eren for the sake of humanity, being utterly free through her choice to love him but still act on what she believes to be right. Armin finds value in the precious little moments and then goes on to attempt to share that value through the events of Attack on Titan, i.e. Eren, which is shown by him being the narrator of the story throughout its run. It's this capacity for empathy and understanding that leads Eren to realize Armin is the one who can go beyond the walls symbolically, unlike him who never could. Let's tell them everything, as the bird drops a feather. Proof of existence and meaning to both Armin and us, the audience who are being told the story. This line is important because it's the culmination of the theme set up by Marco and emphasized throughout. We haven't even had a chance to talk this over. Again, Armin is the narrator of the story, so Attack on Titan is quite literally a story told by Armin to highlight the dangers of hatred, war, and cycles that plague their world. With Eren as the embodiment of all of those things, hence it is his name that is the title of the story. Humanity may never be able to escape the forest, but that doesn't mean we should ever stop trying to create a better tomorrow, and in that hope we can find our own value. Armin is free because he was able to accept the value within himself and within life. Nothing can make us more free than how we view the world we live in. Here is a passage from Steve Hagen's book, Buddhism is not what you think, and I'll leave a link to a video that beautifully delves into AOT's idea of freedom by Redrick below. We spend our time caught up in thought, dividing everything off, separating ourselves from reality, and then we think we lack something and have to fill that lack. Unless we realize this is what we do, we cannot become free because that kind of freedom is just an idea. While you're caught up in that idea, you ignore or deny the clear and obvious truth of this very moment. Armin found freedom in racing to the tree, in reading a book on a rainy day, in feeding a squirrel and even by walking around a market. Armin found freedom in the moment. Finally, there is Eren a tragic character that provides a beautiful message. He was always special merely for the fact that he was born, and freedom can be found through one's mindset, instead of being some physical entity found through the destruction of others. He is a cautionary tale within the narrative, and he's also a cautionary tale to us, the audience. He shows the pitfalls of valuing an idea of freedom or total control over the bonds we share with others, because in life, there will always be things that limit us. There will always be things out of our control. These bonds are important. Our perception is important. We hold within ourselves the key to achieve freedom. Nowhere is this more obvious than in the final ED of the series, which serves as a microcosm of Eren's character. 
A birdcage is formulated around Eren with the lyrics, if we don't have a place to return, we can't go anywhere. I don't want to just live. He creates the birdcage around himself by pushing away his friends and Mikasa, who were his place to return to, as he isn't satisfied with merely living due to his nature. The trapped bird becomes free because of our perception, valuing the beauty in the world along with the cruelty, can be freedom itself. The meaning in the world is what we choose to take from it, but Eren is someone who can never truly value that above his nature. Hence he ends the story trapped in an internal loop, connected to everything and everyone for an incomprehensible amount of time, waiting for the one he loves to kill him, only to start it all again. That is the protagonist of Attack on Titan, who is trapped by his illusion of freedom in a deterministic world. Eren Yeager is the chained god of Shingeki no Kyojin. To finish, let's look at how Isayama, who said he felt the darkest parts of himself were reflected through Eren, views freedom now. I can't wait to walk around a not so fashionable town in the middle of the day in warm weather with a cup in my hand. I think that's what freedom is.